In 1775, the Continental Congress created the Chaplain Corps. Under the command of General George Washington, each soldier was required to attend worship service every Sunday. While other armies advanced on their feet, Washington's troops advanced on their knees. It's time for the Chaplain's Report with Caleb Colquitt on tactics. Chaplain's Report today comes from the book of 1 Samuel, and I didn't really plan this, but we've kind of been working through the book of 1 Samuel, and so I'm thinking we're just going to stick with this for the next few weeks and, and kind of go through and do a real in-depth study on it. Now, I've never done one on a book this long. We've done studies on books in Esther and Daniel, but I really think that there is just so much material in 1 Samuel that this is something that would not only uh, be a focus of us for a long period of time, but looking at it comprehensively would be a way that could greatly enhance our understanding of some of the narratives that are contained within it. So to understand what's going on here, because you may recall the, the last chaplain's report we did was about how the Dagonites, or sorry, the Philistines, gathered up and, and took the Ark of the Covenant. They were worshipers of the idol god Dagon. They took it back to their temple. They laid the Ark of the Covenant in front of their idol Dagon, and they come in, and it's fallen down. So now they're very aware of the fact that the Ark of the Covenant is something that's not supposed to be in their possession. Now they still want it in a battle, and they still want to keep that as a trophy to show as their defeat of Israel. But even though they've taken it out of the temple of Dagon now and, and pulled it away from there, they're now starting to notice other trouble. They take it to Gath, and they notice when they go there that all of the men in the city have been afflicted with tumors. And based on the translation, and this is one of the reasons why I've got to believe that God has a sense of humor, one of the translations that you'll read, and there is some, some uh, implication, or sorry, some... Uh, insinuating here in the Hebrew language is that the tumors sprouted up in their nether regions. So uh, don't tell me God doesn't have a sense of humor here <laughs> that when, when God decides to bring a plague on someone and smite them, he, I mean, for a guy, there's really no worse place that you could have these uh, tumors or sores or whatever they want to refer to them as. And speaking of somebody that's had a tumor in that particular location, I can tell you it's no fun. Uh, but anyway, because, you know, I, I'm a cancer survivor, but uh, they define them as tumors. It was probably more realistically some kind of sore or something like that, which would be a little different. But what's fascinating here is they, the Philistines realize that this is something that is coming from God and that they have angered God by keeping his Ark of the Covenant. They've, they've gotten the message loud and clear, and now they have to decide what they're going to do with it. How are they going to take this plague off of them? Well, they don't want to just take it back to the Israelites. And so they, they get their prophets together and the people who worship their gods and the, the wise men of the city, and they all confer with one another. It's like, all right, here's what we're going to have to do. It's very clear to us we're going to have to get rid of this thing somehow because God is not happy with us keeping his ark from the children of Israel. And, and wherever this thing goes, it causes plagues in whatever city it arrives in. So clearly it's the problem. We've got to figure out a way to get rid of this because it is clear that God's hand is on us, which always astounded me because it, it amazes me how some of the pagans in the biblical narrative seem to have a stronger faith sometimes than even the children of Israel when it comes to God's power and what he can do. Granted, at this point, they had a very good reason for believing that with uh, the, the tumors that had been afflicting them, uh, and the mice, apparently, that had been afflicting them as well. And so this is the solution that the elders and the wise men of the Philistines come up with. They say, all right, what we're going to do is we're going to give an offering inside the ark. So it's not enough to just give the ark back in a way to appease their God, because keep in mind they're pagans and they think like pagans. In order to appease their God, what we're going to do is give their God something that we would normally give our God if we believed our God was mad with us. We will give him an offering of gold. And so what they decide to do is, as a part of their offering, they fashion gold tumors and gold mice and they put it inside the Ark of the Covenant, and then they put the Ark on the Covenant on a cart, 
And then without any men manning it, they just take a couple of cattle and they're the ones pulling the cart and they just send the cart off in the general direction <laughs> of Israel, which is fascinating uh, in a lot of ways. They just had faith that the ark was going to eventually make it to people in Israel and, and this thing would be restored. And also that they, they realized that they had made a they had made God mad and they had to do something to rectify that. So it's interesting that in many ways their assertion was on the right track. And so eventually they're trying to send this thing back to Israel through this means. And what they wind up doing is it gets back to Israel and what they do is they see it, they open it up, they wind up sacrificing the livestock that were sent there. They sacrifice that to God as a sort of a thank you for bringing the ark back into our custody. And then the men there open up the ark and find these gold tumors and these gold mice that the Philistines have put into the ark. And this is the reaction that God has to it. We'll look in 1 Samuel chapter 16, verses 19 through 20. So in this particular passage, it states, he snuck down some of the men of Beth Shemesh, remember that's the city that the Ark of the Covenant has come into, because they had looked into the Ark of the Lord and struck down all of the people, 50,070 uh, 50, men, and the people mourned because the Lord had struck the people with a great slaughter. Twenty, uh, Verse 20, the men of Beth Shemesh said, Who is able to stand before the Lord, this holy God, and whom shall he go up from us? Now, I find this absolutely fascinating because you'll notice that in this verse, God strikes down the people of Beth Shemesh because they had opened up the ark and looked inside it. But to get the offerings inside of the ark, the Philistines would have also had to open it. And they would have also had to seen what was inside the ark in order to place these things inside there as their offering to God. Another thing that's interesting is that when the Philistines decide to send this thing back, they load it up on a cart and send it on its way. Now, granted, it's possible that we see somebody struck dead on the Philistine side from this, from beforehand, like the first Philistine that touches the ark that he's struck dead, just like the Israelite that did so a little bit later in the biblical narrative when David brings the ark of the covenant back to the city of God. Maybe, maybe that happens, but there's no record of it. And there's no record of God being angry with the Philistines for putting this thing on a cart, even though the children of Israel do it later. And he's very mad at them for doing it because they were supposed to get four men of the tribe of Levi to carry it. They're not supposed to put it on a cart. So if God is angry at the Israelites for putting his ark on a cart and for opening up the ark, but not mad at the Philistines for doing the same thing, doesn't that make God inconsistent? Doesn't that mean that God has a double standard? Actually, this is something that I had a problem with for a long time, and it bothered me. And the reason that I started to understand that it wasn't is because the difference was what they knew. You see, the laws of Moses that are contained within the Torah, those were laws specifically given only to the children of Israel and something that they had to obey. We'll see, for example, much later in the story of Jonah when he goes to preach to the city of Nineveh. God tells them to repent. God tells them that he is not happy with their behavior and that if they don't repent, he'll destroy their city, and they do. But Jonah never told them to become Jewish. Jonah never told the Ninevites that they have to convert to Judaism and they have to keep the sacrifices and the Sabbaths and all those things. He didn't do that. And just like God did not expect the Ninevites to become Jewish and to adhere to the law of Moses, which they did not have and had not previously known, he didn't hold that against them. He was angry with the Philistines. He obviously punished them, not only by destroying their idol, but afflicting them with a plague wherever their ark went. He communicated to them 
in a very real and obvious way that he was not happy with what they were doing. But what he did not do is hold them accountable for things that they had no way of knowing what they were supposed to do. I find that really interesting. Because that means that there are some things that God believes universally human beings are supposed to be accountable for and they're supposed to just know. The Philistines, based on the information that they had, based on their knowledge of the children of Israel, should have known that they're not supposed to mess with their God and that if they were to acquire something like the Ark of the Covenant, that God was not going to be happy with them in that. They had enough information to know better than to do that. What they did not have enough information to know better than is to open up the Ark or to put it on a cart to be returned to the children of Israel. And so God did absolutely hold them accountable, but he only held them accountable to the standard by which he had given them specifically and the things that they knew. Because even though putting the Ark of the Covenant on a cart was not something that you were supposed to do, the Philistines didn't know that. And the Philistines actually were trying to rectify their previous mistake by doing so. And so God gives them a little extra leeway. I'm not sure exactly what that would mean for us as modern Christians, because we know that the covenant has now gone from being to the Israelites specifically to universal. That's something that the scripture, the epistles, especially the ones by Paul, make abundantly clear. So I'm not suggesting that this has any implication on us today in the sense that that there are some people that aren't expected to conform to the image of God's Son. We know that there was a time of ignorance that God sort of ignored, but now commands all men everywhere to be baptized. That's something that is stated emphatically in the Scripture. But what I am saying is, I find it really interesting that God, in His justice, understood there are certain people that ought to know better, and some that don't. And I think for people that are learned in the Scripture, for people that do understand certain aspects of it that other people might not, that maybe, even though there's still one standard, and I think this is something that is backed up by Scripture, that some people, for example, teachers, elders, this is something that is brought up in, in Corinthians, that we're held to a high standard because we have more knowledge. We have a responsibility that exceeds those of others if our knowledge is increased. And so I think that that's a, a fascinating thing for us to remember is that if we are going to be people of the Word, if we're going to be people that study the Bible, and, and this is something that we are commanded to do, we can't just say, oh, well, I'd like to be held to a lower standard, so I'm not going to study. Now, that's, that's not how this system works. Because we're commanded to study, and we're commanded to learn as much as we can. And I think that that would put you in danger of your heart not being right with God as well. But ultimately, I do think that it should be a sobering thought to remember that because we do have these blessings and we do have the information that we have, that we are held to a standard and that we are held doubly responsible. And I think that that's something that God has, it's been true of him and his judgments even since Old Testament times. And I think that this verse kind of shows that. Stay the course, friends. It's not exactly a secret that YouTube really doesn't like conservatives, so I'm asking for your help. I don't want to stick it to them, I just genuinely want to show them that conservative voices do matter, and that there is a big, passionate audience out there that wants to hear them. So give us a like and subscribe, remembering to click the notification bell, and show YouTube that you do want more content like this. Sincerely. Thank you.